I was 14 years old when I witnessed the murder of a young man. Earlier in that day, I had attended the visitation of my cousin, who had been shot and killed as well, just a few days before. Upset by his death, I decided to sit on my front porch. And, well, I rarely sat on my front porch of my family home as there had been a rash of shootings in the neighborhood. But that day, I decided that I just needed to get out to get some air. I stepped onto the porch, tears drying on my face, and I could feel the warmth of the sun hitting my face. And it was a nice, sunny day, and there were children playing and running and laughing. But I couldn't have been on the porch for more than 10 minutes when someone was shot and killed across the street from me. This was Chicago in the 1990s, when homicide rates soared, not only in Chicago, but in other major cities across the country. What I remember most about that day is a woman pleading, somebody help that baby. And I stood there, helpless, not able to do anything. And there were children, as young as four, that were also watching all of this unfold. And although I was a child myself, I remember thinking, someone needs to get these children in the house. My mother comes out to see what all of the commotion was about. And she's talking to my brother on the phone who was in prison at the time. And she sees me, my hands shaking, tears running down my face, shock on my face, and she realizes that I witnessed the murder. She hands me the phone, and I'm trying to tell my brother what happened through my cries. And my brother is trying to comfort me. He's saying, I'm sorry you saw that. I'll be home soon. Everything will be OK. I love you, Nisha. And although I had some understanding that prison could be a dangerous place, the only comfort I found in that moment was the thought that my brother was safer in prison than he would have been if he were home with us. What followed were years of nightmares, insomnia, depression, and anger. 16 years later, I'm standing in the middle of a busy emergency room. I've graduated from medical school and I'm now a surgery resident in training. And I can hear the cries of a grieving mother fade through a closing door as I have my hands around a young man's heart and I'm pumping his heart trying to get a heartbeat. We've got a rhythm, I said. In that moment, I realized that I was no longer the 14-year-old hopeless sitting on a porch witnessing a murder. I was saving lives, and I was in a position to help create real systemic change. But how? I am now a trauma surgeon in Atlanta at one of the busiest trauma centers in the country. And in order to create real change and decrease gun violence, we have to understand its history, its current state. We have to understand why. And the why, there are many causes to violence. Although official CDC data is not available, data from the Gun Violence Archive estimates that upwards of 20,000 gun deaths occurred in 2020. That does not include the 24,000 gun suicides or the 80,000 gun injuries not leading to death. And unfortunately, these numbers are increasing upward. And they are the highest we've seen since the height of the crack epidemic in the 1990s. There are many causes to gun violence, including poverty, lack of education, perceptions of hopelessness, lack of opportunity, and prior exposure to violence. Exposure to violence then can lead to post-traumatic stress disorder, alcohol and substance abuse, stunted cognitive and emotional development, as well as an increased likelihood of engaging in violence. Gun violence also has racial disparities as young African American and Hispanic males disproportionately endure the brunt of the problem. Gun violence is centered in areas that have deep-seated roots of structural racism and geographic incongruity. It seems that gun violence is so common that it is almost expected or seemingly accepted. A five-year-old recently told me that her uncle died, and she made it a point to say that he died from illness and not from gun violence. She said he died from sick and not a gun. How pervasive is gun violence that a child 
A five-year-old child knows to specify that a family member died from natural causes and not gun violence. How do we break this cycle? Violence prevention programs have seen varied success. There are a number of models across this country, including group violence intervention and street outreach, hospital and community programs. Hospital and community programs that provide expanded and high quality coordinated social, emotional, and mental support are imperative to re reduce gun violence. These programs must have coordination between hospitals, law enforcement, and members of the community. They must provide care in a cultural appropriate manner and with empathy. It must be trauma-informed care, meaning they must understand that trauma is common and has real consequences. And the psychological consequences of trauma can be devastating. And when we encounter people that may have been touched by violence, whether in the hospital or simply walking down the street, we must understand their plight and work extremely hard not to re-victimize them. There are programs that have used some of these strategies to reduce gun violence. And one of these programs is the Safe and Successful Youth Initiative out of Massachusetts. And this program took high-risk youth and provided education, mentoring, social support, and job assistance. And what that did was reduce homicides in the cities that participated in the program. They also saw a decreased likelihood of reincarceration in the youth that participated in the program versus those that did not. The solution to gun violence is more than just one individual. It takes real systemic change and cultural shifts. Violence-stricken communities need rehabilitation to create sustained and effective change. There needs to be a focus on mentoring, on quality education, on youth programs, on providing social support and job assistance. And there also needs to be a focus on the establishment of pipeline programs. Although the solution to gun violence is more than one individual and requires systemic change, we all have the ability to contribute to the creation of that change. When I graduated from college, I moved back to Chicago. And I had taken a medical school entrance exam and had not done well. And I spent my days looking for a job and studying for the exam in a library in the very same neighborhood I grew up in. The idea of becoming a doctor was becoming no less inconceivable than it was to the 14-year-old sitting on the porch. And I was telling my mentor that I was considering other careers and I, was, I didn't have the money for the exam and maybe I would take it the next year. And he said, no, you take it this year. And he wrote out a check and he handed it to me. And he said, pay me back when you make it big. And I am standing here now a prominent trauma surgeon because I had family who supported me, friends who encouraged me, and sponsors who held me up and said I could achieve anything I put my mind to. The actions you take in a moment have the power to create change that can last a lifetime. The day after I witnessed the death of the young man, I was sitting in my high school first period class and time seemed to move slowly around me as I struggled to listen to the words of the teacher that seemed to play in the background of all of the noise that I had inside of me. And I was taking notes on my notepad and on the side I began to write words like listen, fear, create, mentor. And by the end of the class I had filled the page with feelings and wishes and those things that I thought were solutions to gun violence. And I wondered why it seemed as though no one was doing anything to stop it. And now I look back and realize that there were people mentoring. There were community programs. There were youth programs throughout the cities. And there, there were teachers going above and beyond, just like there are today. And for many of the youth that were able and fortunate enough to experience some part of that, it made a difference. I have had many conversations where the questions or comments are often the same. Where would I even begin to help with reducing gun violence? What can I do? We cannot allow gun violence to be so overwhelming that we feel powerless against it. 
There is power in mentoring. There is power in providing help to community centers, in donating to community centers. There is power in sharing our crafts with others, in sharing our past experience with others, in providing opportunities for others, in listening to others. There is power in providing hope, humility, and humanity, and bringing those things to the table. I am now able to give back to the people and the programs that have helped me along the way. And because of them, I can pay it forward. And I am now putting my mind to violence prevention. And as a trauma surgeon who has seen hundreds of gunshot victims, and as someone who grew up seeing and feeling the effects of gun violence, I urge you to do the same. Inner cities need investment. I encourage you to invest in your city, invest in your neighbor, and invest in yourself.